Hey Kentucky, this is Mary Jo Perino. Tonight, Lexington schools announce a late August return date. We'll also look at the impact of COVID-19 on college and high school sports and talk to one local football coach about his workouts. All that and more is next on Hey Kentucky. Welcome to Hey Kentucky, along with LEX 18 Sports Director Keith Farmer. And Keith, this information today, it's not fully complete, but it's stuff that we as parents have been waiting to hear. Oh, most definitely. Just about schools, I'm, I'm assuming yes. is what you're talking yes. about. We've definitely been waiting for that. Yes. yes, and so here we go. <laughs> Kentucky's two biggest school districts continue working on their return plan for this fall. Leaders in Fayette County Public Schools are putting a plan together to get students back in the classroom on August 24th. That's more than five months after they closed back in March and is later than the normal start date. They've been working on this plan since April, weighing the pros and cons of face-to-face -face instruction and virtual learning, and perhaps at times a blend of both. Many other factors are also being considered outside of the classroom, like transportation, food service, and cleaning. The district is launching a survey so families can weigh in on the possibilities. Meanwhile, leaders in Louisville have been considering delaying the first day of school there. They met this, this afternoon about that and other topics. Keith, um, there are a few plans in place, but the main one is that there will be face-to-face -face instruction and kids wear masks. And the fact that they would go every day as usual, mm -hmm. that's one of the options, right? And I kind of like there was, there was one where you go one week at school, one week off, and then there's the other one where you go two days a week and the other three days are, are all learned online. And, um, you know, I kind of am in favor of that one. I, I was able to ask my son, I, I'm not, you know, answering for my, my five or six or seven or eight year old, my son's in high school. So I asked him what he'd like to do and he gave me his option and that was the one that he kind of chose. Yeah, it's just gonna be really tricky for those that do have six, seven, eight year olds that can't stay home by themselves um, that week off yep. or those couple days off while mom and dad maybe have to go to work. It, it's so tricky. Anyways, in Washington, Kentucky Senator Rand Paul is once again butting heads with the director of the National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. Dr. Anthony Fauci testified before the Senate yesterday, warning senators that more actions need to be taken in order to prevent the spread of COVID-19. But Senator Rand Paul argued that those guiding the response to the outbreak are speculating about their predictions while ignoring data that suggests the pandemic isn't as bad as it seems. Virtually every day we seem to hear from you things we can't do. But when you're asked, can we go back to school? I don't hear much certitude at all. I hear, well, maybe it depends. All of this body of evidence about schools around the world shows there's no surge. All of the evidence shows that it's rare. I feel very strongly we need to do whatever we can to get the children back to school. So I think we are in lock agreement with that. Dr. Fauci went on to say that when he weighs in on certain topics, like if Major League Baseball should play into the fall, it's because he's approached on questions about the coronavirus, not because he's an expert on sports. And Keith, that's what I've noticed about Dr. Fauci is he is only inserting himself in these discussions when he is asked what he thinks. He's not telling us what we have to do. I know, and, and Rand Paul's looking for good news, and, and I'm not sure there's been a whole lot in 2020, so I don't know what he's asking doc, Dr. Fauci to do. He's, uh, as you said, just giving his opinion when asked. Yeah, and, and I mean, who else do we have to go to? Like, they're experts in that field for a reason. Uh, most of us are not. I, mm -hmm. You know, there is uncertainty, even from the experts. It's just part of it right now, I guess, part of the world. Uh, one yeah. of the worst parts of We don't of the, know all, no, about everything. No, we don't. No, nobody <laughs> does. Nobody can. All right, one of the worst parts of the pandemic's impact in Kentucky has certainly been the unemployment fiasco. Governor Bashir says complex claims will now be handled in part by the Ernst & Young accounting firm with the goal of getting all remaining March, April and May claims resolved by the end of this month. Meanwhile, we're hearing from one of the so-called tier one workers who was contracted by the state to answer the phones at the unemployment insurance call center. The man who wants to remain anonymous says he and 500 of his co-workers were let go at the end of May after a frustrating period of service in which he wasn't given power to look into complex problems, leaving half of his callers in the dark. It's easy, I think, to say that the state did make a mistake, but I think that it's also fair to 
entertain the notion that nobody knows what they're doing right now. <laughs> I mean, it, it's, it's all trial and error, it's all hit and miss, and that was really kind of the experience that we had while we were also working. The Bashir administration also says it has secured $865 million in federal loan aid to help Kentucky's Unemployment Insurance Trust Fund. And Keith, that's kind of where I am on everything. It's just like nobody really knows what's going on, what to do. We weren't prepared for this. No, and that little nervous laughter you heard from him, I mean, that kind of says it all. You know, mm -hmm. we don't know. We didn't know what we were doing. We don't know what we're doing. We're trying to get through this for the first time ever. And, uh, you know, we see how that office kind of was run and, and why we are in the position we're in. I am glad that they've taken additional steps. Like, we need outside help now to figure this out. These people yes. need to get some help. So, our Secretary of State, meanwhile, is reflecting on Kentucky's most unusual primary election that's now finally concluded. Many wanted to see if the push for mail-in absentee ballots would work, and Michael Adams says it did. Around 85% of voters chose to mail in their votes, when that number is usually about 2%. A huge bonus was the turnout. The last time a Kentucky primary had this many voters cast a ballot was back in 2008, and that's significant because the presidential nomination was still undecided at that point, and presidential races always draw bigger crowds. This time, that wasn't the case, and more people still voted. But Adam says there's a downside to voting this way. To put this into perspective, it typically takes about $9 million to run an election. My guess is we spent 12 or more for this one. Uh, the mail-in option is very, very expensive. It's not just the man hours for the clerks and their teams, it's also the postage. It's also the printing. It's very expensive. So will the state allow people to vote absentee this fall? Adam says he still needs to look over how everything went this time and how the coronavirus is tracking, but he expects to have an answer no later than Labor Day. And truly, Keith, November seems so far away at this point when you hear about cases spiking across the country. I assume there's going to be some form of absentee voting. Yeah, I, I think so too, but I also would like to believe there's going to be more than one polling place in Lexington and Louisville. And, and it doesn't have to be many more, but let's make it four or five spread out across the county and make it a little easier to vote in person if you so wish. But hey, I, I think we all like the way that the absentee voting went. Yeah, I, and I think you're right and I agree with you and I think there will be more locations. Now a look at the impact of the coronavirus on sports. We know that six of the 106 UK football players who returned to campus tested positive for a past infection and have since been cleared to return for voluntary workouts. But as activities increase over the next month, the testing process will ramp up as well. The team physician says he expects it to expand as players begin practice and therefore are unable to maintain social distance or wear personal protective equipment. On the high school level, some disappointing news out of Tennessee where the governor has extended the state of emergency until August 29th, which will push back the beginning of football season and soccer season for uh, girls. Keith, I, when I saw that, I was nervous. Yeah, and, and I've even seen where now they've at least set a date on September 19th for football to begin. but. When you think about that, that's going to affect Kentucky because there are a lot of teams and schools down along the border of Tennessee that quite often go across or have teams come across the border to play them, and it's already going to affect like one of the pigskin classics. There were two games that involved Kentucky-Tennessee schools, and those are now off, the whole, whole you know, start of a season for those two uh, schools. So we're going to see it affect Kentucky as well. Absolutely. All right, up next on Hey Kentucky, a Lexington football coach talks about life in the COVID-19 era. Frederick Douglass High School's Nathan McPeak will talk about how his workouts with his team are going this offseason. Stay with us.